Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which brings you this weekly talk show. And we'll be talking about threats to abortion rights, to Afghan women, and more with author, atheist, and columnist for the nation, Katha Pollitt. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. We're excited that our guest today is Katha Pollitt, who's been writing an award-winning column, Subject to Debate, for the nation since 1995. She's the author of several books, including Reasonable Creatures, Subject to Debate, and Virginity or Death, Learning to Drive, one of my favorites, and most recently, Pro, Reclaiming Abortion Rights. Katha Pollitt has received an Emperor Has No Clothes Award and a Forward Award from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Besides being a feminist, Katha Pollitt is an atheist who has eloquently termed religion a farrago of authoritarian nonsense, misogyny, and humble pie, the eternal enemy of human happiness and freedom. So welcome back to Free Thought Matters, Katha. Hi, thanks for having me. Nice, nice to have you. So first, Katha, a subject that's dear to your heart and my heart, your book on abortion rights, Pro, reclaiming abortion rights. And you talk about abortion as a social good. How so? People are very accustomed to think of abortion as a terrible, terrible thing that is nonetheless necessary or women will die. In my book, I argue that abortion is actually a social good in the sense that it makes society better. And it, it's better for women, it's better for men, it's better for children to come into the world when they're wanted. Um, nobody benefits from having abortion be uh, difficult or impossible to, to get. Um, and that's why around the world, uh, the trend, the general trend is to have more liberal abortion laws. Isn't it true that in America, one in three women have had an abortion? I think it's one in four, but uh -huh. it's a lot, <laughs> whatever, it's a lot. Um, and yes, and when you think of how uh, how women are made to feel ashamed of that, that's one reason why people think they don't know someone who's had an abortion because people don't talk about it. But if, in fact, almost everybody knows someone who's had an abortion so who just has gone public. Excuse me. So you you talk about normalizing the idea of abortion. Yes, I think that when something is that common. Um, and that much a part of American life, it should be something that we can discuss in a rational way as something that's going to happen, that does happen, that has always happened in our history. Um, you know, an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know is that abortion was legal in most states until after the Civil War. Um, and then it was legalized by Roe after a few states had already legalized it in 1973. So there was really a hundred year period in which abortion was illegal. Um, when George Washington and Martha were, uh, were living in the White House, except there wasn't a White House, mm -hmm. um, abortion was legal. During the whole long colonial history of our country, abortion was legal. Um, and so the idea that 
it's not in the constitution yeah it wasn't in the constitution because it wasn't uh controversial it was just something women did and the less you talked about it the better because oh it's women you know um so um really for most of our history abortion has been legal so more than just being normalized or being legal you know annie laurie's mother ann gator wrote a book called abortion is a a blessing it's not something to be ashamed of but it's something that a lot of women consider to be a positive in their lives isn't that true well it is true um, because abortion legal or before it was legal is what lets women get an education it lets women keep their jobs it lets women have children with the man they want to have children with instead of you know, some high school boyfriend that they wouldn't even remember in a couple of years. Um, it lets, it's what lets women escape abusive relationships without being tied. I mean, imagine being tied for the next 18 years or more to some man who really does not have your best interests at heart at all. That happens. Um, abortion is what lets women live a decent life. And it lets men live a decent life. People don't talk about this, but you know, it, it can't be a good thing that men uh, father these children they never have anything to do with. Um, so, or ne never intended to have anything to do with. That can't really be a happy story for a lot of, for a lot of people. Um, and it's good for children to come into the world when their parents are ready to take care of them. So your book came out, Pro came out in 2014, and at that time you warned that although most Americans are pro-choice, uh, we need to shed our complacency and get active. I did say that, and uh, <laughs> did that happen? Um, I think in some places it did. You know, I mean, Virginia is a blue state now because the Republicans wanted to make everyone who wanted an abortion have a transvaginal ultrasound, remember that? And that enraged people. And that set the ball rolling where the Democrats took back the state and now they hold all the statewide offices. I think that some people have really woken up, but not enough. Um, it's still the case that people really don't know what's going on. They think, well, abortion's always been here for me. So it's part of life. They're not really going to get rid of it. And also, I think a lot of women think, well, they make abortion harder to get, but it won't be harder to get for me um, because I can go to a place where abortion is readily available, like New York City, or I can uh, I can pay whatever astronomical sum will be demanded when abortion is 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 that makes abortion out of reach for a lot of people. So one thing that's troubling, Katha, is that this, as you know, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear this case um, out of Mississippi, is it? Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Yeah. And you've written and you've said that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, the future will be worse than it was before. What's at stake with this case? This is a case that would criminalize abortion after 15 weeks. Um, most abortions, as most people don't know, happen much earlier than that in pregnancy, but there are uh, plenty of abortions that happen uh, after 15 weeks. Um, and I, why did they choose 15 weeks? I have no idea. In my piece, I wrote abortion will be worse in some ways and it'll be a little bit better than in others it, from the time when it was illegal before. The way it'll be better is that now we have misoprostol, mifepristone, medical abortion. And those pills are, uh, you can, well, now you can buy them on the internet and just hope you get the real thing. Um, but there will be a huge black market in those pills, um, and they're safe. They're they're safe. It's, it's it's not like a knitting needle. It's not like throwing yourself down the stairs. But I want to say that people still, do, you know, even though abortion is legal, and even though uh, medication abortion is, you can find it if you look for it. There are still women who do the knitting needles, who do the, er the herbal preparations, um, who uh, do horrible things to themselves that are very, very dangerous um, because not everybody knows about these pills or is, is able to get them. So there will be less death, I think, if abortion is criminalized again. But the way in which it will be worse is that 
when abortion was illegal, it was a misdemeanor. Um, they didn't go after women, even if they went, they, they might subpoena them to appear in court to testify against the provider, um, but they didn't threaten them with, they didn't put women in jail. Um, and they didn't put the people who help women find the abortion in jail either um, or pay for it. But now we have had almost 50 years of very, very intense identification of abortion with murder. And once you use words like that, anything goes, right? Um, and so we've already seen women, uh, women putting, put in jail for not delivering a live baby. Um, yeah. because you know, and where it's blamed on drugs, it's blamed on improper, improper self-care, all kinds of things. Um, and so the stakes, the moral stakes have been raised enormously higher. And so I think that when, if, sorry, if I should say, abortion is criminalized, either at the state or God forbid, the federal level, we will see, we will see providers being, uh, being arrested. We will see people who uh, help women get abortions, like her mother who goes with her to the clinic, the boyfriend who gives her some money, et cetera, et cetera. We will see all that happening. And in fact, this new law in uh, the special to go into effect, uh, I think it's on September 2nd um, in, in uh, Texas, which allows anyone to sue anyone involved with an, a post six week abortion, which is, you know, most of them, um, as just as a member of the public and sue, sue them for money damages, they can get $10,000. So just imagine what that means. I mean, you're gonna find, you know, your nosy neighbor, uh, your ex-boyfriend, uh, anyone who is angry at you, uh, the organized anti-choicers um, who are very, uh, energetic in their pursuit of anything having to do with abortion. Um, we're going to see a real, um, uh, I'm looking for a non four letter word <laughs> to describe it. We're going to see a real nightmare, a, a real storm of craziness if that law is allowed to stand. So Katha, you have written about this backlash, the QAnon, the backlash against race theory and other issues. And you've said reason can be helpless against demagoguery, paranoia, and lies, and why should we think anything differently will happen with abortion rights? And on that critical note there, I think that we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk to you about what religion has to do with this, and we're also going to talk about Afghan women and overpopulation with Katha Pollitt. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hanahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experiences being an atheist through my life, I've found that uh, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. 
Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. Free Thought Matters is back, and we're talking with our favorite columnist, Katha Pollitt of The Nation, whose most recent book is called Pro, Reclaiming Abortion Rights. So, Katha, um, before I ask you the next question, in the previous segment, <clears throat> you said, God forbid, but you're an atheist, so what goes with that? <laughs> Well, I live in hope that, you know, he's listening. What can uh, I say? <laughs> or she, he or she is or listening. she, she yeah. is listening. So yeah. be, before they, we, they are listening. Before we talk about Afghan women, which has a lot to do with intersecting religion, let's just briefly talk about the role of religion in threatening abortion rights. I mean, it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Well, yeah, you know, uh, there is nothing in the Bible about abortion, nothing, nothing in the Old Testament, nothing in the New Testament. In fact, there are these obscure, weird passages in the Old Testament that seem to imply that sometimes abortion would be um, part of some judicial process. I don't really understand it, but um, abortion uh, has become a flashpoint in American life because of the power of the evangelical fundamentalist movement and the Catholic Church. Um, I mean, it's not religion in general. It, it, you know, Judaism is not against abortion. Judaism, there are circumstances under which you're required to have an abortion. The mother's health and life always come first in Judaism. And um, so it's really politicized Christianity. Um, the Catholic Church has always played a big role in trying to keep abortion illegal back when it was illegal and trying to make it illegal now. But Protestants, this is kind of a new thing for them. Um, it's weird because around the time that abortion, just before abortion was made legal, the Southern Baptists issued a statement saying, well, maybe we need to look at this again. You know? mm. So. Um, it's all very flexible. It's it's all about politics. But if you if you think it's killing, if you do, and the Bible says thou shalt not kill, isn't that kind of a cut and dry thing for a lot of believers? Well, I think for a lot of believers it is. Um, but for the rest of us, it's not so cut and dry because uh, to say that a fertilized egg is a person is very, very dicey isn't it? Um, when, especially when you consider how many miscarriages there are, um, how many eggs never implant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the main thing is that abortion is connected to anti-feminism. Yeah. I mean, being against abortion is connected to anti-feminism, which all these patriarchal religions are against. And so the idea that a woman should be able to make up her mind about what happens in her body is not something that they are happy about. So speaking of patriarchal religions trying to control women, let's turn to the situation in Afghanistan. And, and I should point out that we're recording this uh, before the August 31st pullout deadline while chaos is reigning at the airport in Afghanistan. And you've written that it's not just the Taliban uh, um, that's the issue, the problem. What what are Afghan women facing, and what does the United States owe Afghan women? Well, um, I don't want to pose as an expert here because I'm not. I am, I think, the only columnist who doesn't present him or herself as a big expert on, on Afghanistan. I always oppose the war, um, and I'm sorry to have been proven right about it. Um, uh, when I said it wasn't just the Taliban, what I meant was that the Taliban aren't the only um, reactionary jihadi social force in Afghanistan. There, there, there were a lot of them, and there were all those warlords too, and they were not the friend of women either. Um, and you know, it's a cult, it's a whole culture. I don't think we want to oversimplify here, um, but of course, the Taliban is very terrible. It will be very terrible for women. And even though, as, I, as I'm talking to you, um, they're, they make some noises, you know, women will be allowed to do whatever is uh, okay under Islam. Um, and, you know, there are Muslim countries where women have been the president. Um, there are Muslim mm -hmm. countries where women are very educated and successful. Um, 
So, but I don't really trust the Taliban on this. I think this is what they're saying for international consumption. And is there anything that we can do to help Afghan women? Well, in my piece, I recommend some groups that people can can donate to. Um, one of them is the Afghan Women's Fund, which I've been a supporter of for many years. And another is the Women for Afghan Women that runs domestic violence and other and shelter shelters for women throughout the country. And both these groups and also Madre, another a uh, very good group. They're trying right now, as I'm talking to you, their big thing is trying to get their people out, trying to and trying to find safe haven for, for women who will be threatened by the Taliban um, as educated women, working women, women <clears throat> involved in public life. Um, so I think if you donate to them, that would be a really wonderful thing. So uh, overpopulation. Earlier this year, you wrote does the world need more people? And you answer it by saying, not if you ask the glaciers, the rainforests, the air, or the more than 37,000 plus species on the verge of extinction. You point out, what are there, 7.9 billion of us and it's growing, and that we've more than fulfilled the biblical injunction to be fruitful and multiply. Tell us more about why we need to be talking about population. Well, um there are a lot of people in the world. There are a lot. And you know, there are some, I'm sure there's some theoretical model where you could have many more billions and it wouldn't damage the environment and there would be enough water and air and every, uh, clean air and everything for all if we had a completely different socioeconomic system in the, in the world. Um, it's, mostly, uh, it's mostly the wealthy countries that are driving climate change and ex extinction. It's not, um, you know, people living uh, in rural Africa um, who always are targeted for population control. Um, but are we going to do that? Are we going to do that in, in time, have this entirely different social system um, where um, everything is driven by a need to conserve? I don't think so. Um, so um, I think that people are probably pretty gonna, gonna pretty much live the way they've been living, uh, consuming too much, right. <laughs> driving <laughs> driving their cars too much, um, running their air conditioners too much, um, and this is this is very very bad. This is terrible. And I think that um, it is true that popul in in the developed world, population is really um, not in people are having fewer and fewer children and population increases in places because of the the bulk of uh people that are already there um having fewer even if they have fewer children but um i think that it would really be good if people were just a little more conscious of uh where we are where we are headed we bought a uh, hybrid so Oh, okay. All right. So that's, some, okay. that's something, isn't it? It seems like we measure uh, the the strength of our economy based on growth and consumption. So all these things are going the wrong direction. And here everybody is so concerned about climate change. And yet your column, this is about all I've seen in years about anybody pointing out the connection between overpopulation, too many people, and what we're doing to the environment. Yes, well, they are connected, aren't they? You know, I got some flack for that column because people felt, you know, oh, you're blaming people, you don't like children. I love children, I have a daughter, I have a granddaughter, I have two granddaughters, they're great. Um, so um, it's not about that. It's about how um, we have to just be a little more careful about a lot of things. And one of them is not, you know, there's, there's the right wing is always saying, you know, oh, we need more people. We need more people because we need more brains to get us out of this hole that we've dug for ourselves. Well, you know, I always think that's so ridiculous because if you look back at history, look at ancient Greece, look at Athens. Athens had a population that was like the size of Peoria, Illinois, and it was full <laughs> of unbelievably uh, smart, interested, focused, great people. 
um, doing all the great things that we think of in, as you know ancient Greece doing. So it's not the number of people, it's the cultivation of people. It's what the opportunities people are given. And when people talk about this, I always think, think of all the people we throw away right now. People who don't get enough education, poor people who don't get enough education as kids to prepare them for the world we're, we're living in. Um, people who are just- uh, Thrown away. Not, they're just, they're, they're, you know, millions of people in this country are basically thrown away. Why do we do that? And then talk about how we need more people. No, we don't we need more people. We need those people. Quality over quantity, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you also, in, in your column, uh, pointed out that population issues, of course, always come down to the issue of controlling women. And we have about half a minute left. Any other comment on that? Well, yeah, because it's all about, you know, you're not a good woman if you don't have kids. Um, you need to have kids. If you want to do something else, um, then that proves that you're just a selfish bitch. Um, I mean, this is this kind of thinking is rampant. And also, if you want to have children in a different way, if you want to have children with another woman, for example, it's all about reimposing a very conservative model of the family on a world that is really kind of moving away from that. Well, I think time for one final question. When we first got to know you, you were one of the few public figures on TV willing to identify as an atheist. Are you happy to have more company today? Uh, well, I still don't believe in God, but I'll tell you the truth. The whole question of whether God exists is less interesting to me now than it was. I think everything that could be said on all sides of that was already said, you know, in the 18th century. And we're just treading, uh, you know, the same old arguments, the same old ground. And just for me, in the last few, you know, hundred years of my life, I would just be happy if we had separation of church and state. I mean, that was a really great idea. Huh. Um, amen, and sister. We can and all we, say we, amen we, to we, yeah, we've moved so far away from that. Well, thank you, Katha Pollitt, for keeping us all on our toes, and thanks for joining us today on Free Thought Matters. Thanks so much for having me. It was really great. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.